Hey everyone, I'm Suha. I'm really, really excited to be here today. And with that, let's get started. So I want to talk to you about ML security. Specifically, I want to talk about this new class of exploits I identified called incubated ML exploits, which combine backdoors and input handling bugs. Don't worry if you don't know too much about ML or ML security. I'll explain all the important stuff as we go along. So uh, who am I and why am I even talking to you today? Uh, I'm an engineer at Trail of Bits, where I focus on AI and ML security. I've been in the field for a few years now. I graduated from Georgia Tech, and I'm originally from Queens. Uh, outside of work, I like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, trying new restaurants, making things, and an obscure card game called Q-Birds. So it's becoming pretty clear that with ML and AI popping up everywhere, people are figuring out how to trick these systems based on how these models work. Maybe you've seen someone use prompt injection to convince a chatbot to give them a refund. Or maybe you've seen this story of protesters tricking self-driving cars with traffic cones. Notice the fact that this trick is rooted in an understanding of the training data for these models. So how can we actually construct our own useful exploits against ML systems? Let's play a game of pretend real quick. You're a college student, and you really, really want the prize money for a robotics competition. So naturally, you decide to sabotage another team. Uh, side note, I do not condone this behavior. I don't recommend it. I've never done it myself. Uh, but anyway, the competition requires teams to build a tiny autonomous vehicle that uses a specific pre-trained model and stops at stop signs. So you go ahead, and you find out that some of these stop signs have stickers on them. And you also find some flaws with how they've stored and distributed the model. Now, uh, that, by the way, isn't out of the question. ML artifacts are often shared widely without any meaningful or substantial trust mechanisms. So you go ahead, you decide to grab that file and inject a model backdoor in it using a file format RC, RCE of some kind. And then you put it back. Then, on the day of the competition, you sit back and you watch as your competitor's vehicle just plows through and ignores any stop sign with a sticker on it. What you just did is execute an incubated ML exploit, which is what my talk is all about. Obviously, the stakes of this story is just a lost competition. But the notion of attacking a real autonomous vehicle is a hallmark of model backdoor research, as you can see with the image on the left. So I'll let you use your own imagination to raise the stakes. So first, I'm going to tell you about this framework I've been using to bridge the gap between model and system security, because we can't continue to treat models as standalone objects. Next, I'll tell you about these input handling bugs I found in model serialization and connect them to backdoors. I'll do that by taking a page out of this subfield called LangSec, or language theoretic security. Uh, so effectively, I'm going to be going through a bunch of examples of incubated ML exploits and use LangSec to organize them. But first, I need to explain some stuff. What even is a model vulnerability or an, M or an ML backdoor? So uh, super briefly, you can think of ML models like these squishy, flexible sequences of linear algebra operations that are trained on tons and tons of data. Uh, there's a popular saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. It's just saying that these models aren't perfect. There are many different ways that models can mess up or get tripped up by something that might be unexpected to us. And that's the basis of these model vulnerabilities. While popular examples of model vulnerabilities include model inversion and membership inference, we're zooming in on one specific type, backdoors. So to be precise about it, a backdoor attack allows a malicious actor to force an ML model to produce specific outputs given specific inputs. Now, there's a couple of things that I think make backdoors really, really interesting to study. So you can use them as primitives for other model vulnerabilities, like membership inference. You can also identify pre-existing, quote unquote, natural backdoors in models. And there's also some pretty strong evidence that suggests that this is an inherent threat to ML systems. Now, while there's a lot of awesome research out there on ML model attacks, they can actually be pretty hard to exploit in the real world, with some exceptions, of course. And while there are multiple reasons for it, one thing that really sticks out to me is the gap between research and the real world. 
So for the most part, many attacks and subsequently attack frameworks and tools restrict their analysis to this formulation. An ML model receives an input and produces an output. But this isn't an accurate representation of what an ML system actually looks like. There's so much more going on in practice. So here is a software architecture diagram for an ML system reviewed by Trilobits recently. This is a system that uses the Ask Astro tool for RAG, and I've circled where the model actually is in the photo. Do you see what I mean? We need to be looking at all of this holistically. There's a large and evolving landscape of tools being used in and for ML systems. And that brings me to the exploit framework. So the title of my talk clearly references an incubated ML exploit. But there's a larger category of exploits that I'd like to, that are important to think about first. Specifically, a hybrid ML exploit chains a system security issue with a model vulnerability. So if you look at the diagram, you see that the arrow here is bidirectional. Uh, so this can go in either direction. A model vulnerability can expose a system security issue, or a system security issue could be used to exploit a model vulnerability. Now this part's pretty important. The big issue I see with how ML security is done nowadays is that model security and system security are often treated separately. But what I need you to understand is that if you only know model security, you're missing a big piece. And if you only cover system security, you're still missing a big piece. And you can't be treating these two processes as completely independent. You're then entirely ignoring the potential for hybrid ML exploits. This is an emergent property. Your model is embedded in a system that is going to interact with all of your different system components in new and exploitable ways. So one thing you'll notice is that there's a lot of screenshots of paper titles on this slide. That's because there have been specific instances of hybrid ML exploits in the literature and in practice. They're just not explicitly called that. So exploitable software gadgets have been used for backdoors. The summoning demons paper at the top chained model evasion with memory corruption. And the learn system security paper next to it includes an example of a poisoning attack that causes an exponential memory blow up in an index structure. But the ML security literature, frameworks, and tools, at the very least the ones I'm familiar with, are largely limited to just that, specific instances or implications. What I'm trying to do here, what I want to be doing here, is treating this interaction explicitly and systematically, which is why I made this framework. So one kind of system security issue is an input handling bug, and one kind of model vulnerability is a model backdoor. Put that together, and that's how we get an incubated ML exploit, uh, which is a type of hybrid ML exploit where an attacker uses an input handling bug to inject a backdoor. So I made this diagram to make the distinction between the two uh, a lot clearer. And here it is again. I'm going to be leaving the framework here for now. Uh, we did end up going into a more formal model of exploitation, especially like a schema for incubated ML exploits. But we'll, we'll return to these ideas later. So to backdoor a pre-existing model, the attacker should be able to change the parameters of the model or its architecture. At the level of abstraction we're dealing with, we can put input and component manipulation on the side for now. But how this actually plays out can vary a lot. So sometimes the attacker has control over some element of the training process. And they use that to sneak in some manipulated data that will change the model's parameters, which is often called data poisoning or maybe they go a step further and fiddle with the source code somehow to change the architecture. Now, before we dive into exploits, I wanna explain a few things about input handling bugs. So an ML model is stored as a file, and to process these models, you need parsers, and parser, parsing these files into objects and back is deserialization and serialization. But wait, quoting Anjal Bertini here, a file has no intrinsic meaning. The meaning of a file, its type, its validity, its contents can be different for each parser or interpreter. This is the reason we can make potentially malicious file artifacts like polyglots and ambiguous files, which I'll talk a bit more about later. So I'm focused very specifically on bugs that occur when you parse ML model files. There's of course also interesting bugs in other parts of the pipeline but I'm picking ML model files for several reasons. The first is very, very obviously the most important. 
I think it's fun. But more seriously, the security of ML file formats have become increasingly important. ML has fostered this culture of sharing these artifacts without sufficient validation. Real malicious models have been found on the Hugging Face Hub, for example. And there's also just a ton and a ton of ML file formats out there. I've tried to list and organize these in the repository listed in the middle. Uh, but what's really important to take away is that there's a large set of possibilities for these exploits. Also, just fun hacks with these formats. And there's already a lot of great work on this in this area as shown on this slide. So file format tricks are within the realm of LangSec, but this field actually thinks more abstractly about inputs as a general class. LangSec applies formal language theory to system security. It focuses on exploring input handling bugs, also called parser problems, as this big root cause for security issues. After all, lots of impactful vulnerabilities like Heartbleed and Android Master Key have been parser bugs. Now, while I like formal language theory, uh, this talk isn't theoretical computer science 101. So uh, what I want you to know is that fundamentally what LangSec is saying is, hey, let's treat all the inputs as a specific language and then make our code just capable enough to understand that language properly. So our work is centered around a specific taxonomy of input handling bugs. Uh, here are all the different bug classes. There are eight different types. Now, quick note, these categories aren't completely distinct from each other. Uh, the one you choose comes from a root cause analysis. So with the exception of one, I'm going to show you multiple examples of each in ML tools and use them to construct a backdoor. Uh, so I. Once again, in order to show that input handling bugs are an attack vector, I identified ML model serialization issues across these different bug classes and built backdoors out of them. So now we can dive into the most fun part, the exploits. Uh, specifically for the sake of time, I'm going to focus more on the useful gadgets that actually arise in these situations. So these are some characters that play important roles in the ML ecosystem that can help us understand the impact of these exploits better. First up, we have Alice. Alice distributes models. She takes open source LLMs and fine tunes them. The models she distributes are what everyone else in our story is going to be using. Bob is a frontline user who's directly using Alice's models in his own life, maybe through a chat interface. Uh, there's Dave. Dave is an engineer who's integrating these models into products. Frank is the end user who's relying on Dave's products. He might be unaware that there's ML models behind the scenes. Uh, last, we have Chuck. Chuck is the attacker. Uh, he's looking to exploit vulnerabilities in the models and disrupt everyone's work. Our focus will be on how Chuck can impact Bob and Dave here. So I'll show some exploits involving the file formats associated with Pickle, uh, PyTorch, TorchScript, OnanX, and Safe Tensors. So this first category is called non-minimalist input handling code. It sounds a little fancy, but all it means is that the code used to check and parse the inputs is too complex so an attacker can potentially grab the necessary gadgets for their exploits. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this, case, uh, this case is relatively common. Uh, pickling is a serialization method that allows you to save arbitrary objects. Uh, and pickling is very, very common in the ML ecosystem. Uh, there's no way to understate that. Um, so. Uh, Recent, uh, there's no way to overstate that, excuse me. So recently, my coworker, Boyan Milanov, led the development of Sleepy Pickle, which is an incubated ML exploit. And what it does is that it chains Pickle, a Pickle RCE with model backdoors. So on the right, you can see an LLM that has been backdoored to fish users. There's also examples of an LLM being backdoored to spread misinformation and even steal user data in the blog post. Now, what's really cool about this exploit is that it can happen on the fly. So there's far more room and possibilities for an attacker than just uploading a malicious model. So what do I mean when I say pickle RCE? Python pickles are compiled programs that run in a unique virtual machine called the pickle machine, or the PM for short. 
And what the PM does is that it interprets a sequence of opcodes in the pickle file to construct an arbitrarily complex Python object. Um, but it has two opcodes, global and reduced, that can execute arbitrary code outside of the PM, which makes it possible to construct malicious pickle data. And the underlying reason here is that the PM is more complex than something that's only parsing ML models should actually be. So way, way back in 2021, we released this tool called Fickling. This project was led by Evan Sultanic. So to our knowledge, Fickling was the first pickle security tool tailored for ML use cases. It's a decompiler, static analyzer, and bytecode rewriter for the Python pickle module. Uh, it can help you detect, analyze, or create malicious pickle files. Now, the reason it's safe to run on potentially malicious files is because it has its own implementation of the PM uh, on, which it, uh, on which it symbolically executes code. So I also added a PyTorch module to it relatively recently so that you can statically analyze and inject code into PyTorch files as well. But uh, moving forward, pickles are clearly an issue for Bob. If Alice is distributing models as pickle files or PyTorch files, that makes it that much easier, easier for Chuck to inject a backdoor with a pickle RCE. Now onto the next class. This term just means you shouldn't try to correct invalid input, reject it altogether. Uh, it's been uh, sometimes referred to as the anti-robustness principle. So to mitigate the issues with pickling, many developers write these things called restricted unpicklers, which are subclasses of unpickler that enforce an allow list or a block list. But the thing is, these actually aren't that hard to bypass. Uh, there's this methodology called pain pickle that demonstrates how to automatically bypass restricted unpicklers, which can enable arbitrary code execution and that therefore backdoor attacks. So they identified eight different types of unpicklers and three strategies that work against the vast majority of them. So much like pickle was a problem for Bob, restricting, restricted unpickling bypasses is bad for Dave if he's relying on them in some fashion in his product. So now we can talk about parser differentials. So this happens when different parsers in a system read the same input but interpret it differently. So when two parsers are interpreting the same file in different ways, that file is known as an ambiguous file. So this is a pretty common exploit technique. It's really good for bypasses. But it means you can create an ML model file that is benign for one system or one system component, but backdoored for another. Uh, there's some more implications here for ML system exploitation more broadly, but we'll talk about that later. But a uh, quick note, whether or not this is impactful all depends on your system, right? So this is where threat modeling comes in handy. So we were able to create two differential proof of concepts with TorchScript. TorchScript is a popular format to store ML models in for a bunch of reasons, but mostly performance and portability. But you can make a parser differential with it and chain it to an architectural backdoor. That's because you can turn a PyTorch model into a TorchScript one through tracing or scripting. And tracing doesn't incorporate dynamic control flow. So all you have to do is represent the malicious components for the back door through dynamic control flow. So the second example we found was during an audit of YOLO. So last year, my team and I audited this open source uh, code base for computer vision called YOLO v7. And what they did is they released standard versions of their model and Tor scripted versions for deployment. So we noticed many cases where tracing didn't capture the model accurately. After serialization and deserialization, key info was lost, and the usual PyTorch warnings didn't show up. So to spot this differential, we used the TorchScript Automatic Trace Checker, TorchFX, and the TorchScript IR. But with what we found, we created an input that made the two versions of the model act differently, effectively a backdoor attack. Uh, so once again, this is a problem for Bob. He's getting a fundamentally different model that, than the one Alice trained, which breaks any pre-existing uh, promises. So we also identified a parser differential with safe tensors. Safe tensors is another file format for ML models that was developed specifically in response to the insecurity of pickling. So last year, I was on an audit of the safe tensors library where we identified the inclusion of JSON in the file format as a source of parser differentials. Now, JSON is pretty well known to be underspecified. There's a lot of exploits, especially in the web security world, that leverage this. Uh, but the thing is, the reference safe tensors implementation uses the third parser, which is strict and rejects duplicate keys. 
but a lot of external tools use the Python built-in JSON parser, which doesn't. So you can use a duplicate key for the offsets to append back doored weights and create manipulated safe tensors files. So these files are rejected by the reference implementation, but accepted by external parsers. Quick note, it has to be a weights-based backdoor because weights and architecture are stored separately here. Uh, there's some more details and caveats regarding exploitability, but just know that the safe tensors parser differential is more impactful for Dave. He needs to be making sure that there's consensus, there's agreement between the parsers and his product. If his tool is using a more permissive safe tensors parser than the reference implementation, it could accept manipulated safe tensors files that actually carry backdoored models. So one big part of my research is analyzing previous works and noticing trends. And I don't want to get too into the weeds with this because I'd like to save formalisms for accompanying materials. But one thing that became clear is from parser differentials, we get these things called model differentials, instances where the same model is interpreted differently. And as expected, the attacks are dependent on the supply chain component and the lifecycle stage. So in an ML system, you can pre-process inputs and you can also apply model transformations before you deploy a model. So some studies have exploited parser differentials right at the pre-processing stage. So things like image scaling or Unicode parsing. Um, those attacks often change the weights. There have also been backdoor attacks that take advantage of differences during model transformations like compilation and quantizations. Those frequently change the architecture. I think it's very possible that most transformations that can be encoded within the loss function can result in an exploitable backdoor. But uh, let's move forward from here. Next up is shotgun parsing. This is just what happens when you don't fully and properly check your input before beginning to process it. So let's talk about polyglot files, which are files that can be validly interpreted as two or more different formats. Um, they're a personal uh, favorite rabbit hole of mine. But uh, polyglot files have been utilized to distribute malware, bypass code signing checks, and enable other malicious behaviors. But with regards to ML model serialization, these can be placed in model hubs to confuse downstream consumers. Uh, but even more importantly, two different ML pipelines could interpret the same file as two different models. So you can smuggle in a backdoor model with the benign one. So during our audit of the Safe Tensors library, we were able to make multiple polyglots. These include zip, PDF, TF records, Keras native, and later on PyTorchMar. And the Safe Tensors audit report itself was a PDF zip polyglot with a zip file containing all of the polyglots we made during the audit. So you can just slap on a weights-based backdoor model to, in one of these formats to a benign model in Safe Tensors. So you open it up with Safe Tensors, everything's good, everything's fine, load it up with PyTorch Mar or some other system, and boom, you've got your backdoor. Big problem for uh, folks like Dave here because uh, now you've got malicious models sneaking in with benign ones. The ov overall reason this is possible is because of a missing check. Specifically, the program didn't check whether uh, the start and end offsets corresponded with the tensor size, so attackers could append arbitrary data to a file. And that, when combined with the ability to change the header size, expanded the number of polyglots. This issue has since been fixed with safe tensors, however. Uh, important note. So our next category is incomplete protocol specification. Just think of it as under specification for now. Uh, while there's multiple uh, examples of this in the literature, we'll just focus on PyTorch polyglots for now. So many are unaware that PyTorch actually supports multiple file formats. Some are deprecated but are still supported by external parsers. And one big issue is that there's a lack of consistent versioning here. So that means you can create polyglots of files that can be validly interpreted as different PyTorch file formats. Uh, also, you can create ambiguous files. So you can add three files to Polymock uh, version 1.3 and TorScript 1.4. Another bigger issue is the reliance on zip and pickle here. So pickle is a streaming file format that ends once it reaches the stop opcode, which means when you're parsing it, any data after that stop opcode is fair game. Another thing is, most zip parsers don't enforce the magic at the start, like the PyTorch Mar. So you can append a zip to a pickle file to create a zip pickle polyglot, which gives you some good PyTorch polyglots. 
Uh, Fickling now has a polyglot module, so you can differentiate, identify, and create um, polyglots for the different PyTorch file formats. Uh, now on to the next class. This one just means that your input should be simple and well-defined, well so you can check it thoroughly. Take O and an X. O and an X is a protobuf-based way to store ML models. Adeline Travers discovered a neat hack for ONNX that he packaged into a tool called Blubotomy. Uh, so ML runtimes and frameworks often let you add custom operators to a model on the fly. And the language used for ONNX runtime custom ops is complex. So even though the official specification disallowed side effects, in the ONNX runtime, arbitrary code could be encapsulated in a custom op. And you can use that to launch an architectural backdoor attack. Just like Pickle, this is bad news for Bob. So to recap, Bob, our direct consumer, was affected by the Pickle, ONNX, and TorchScript exploits. Uh, Dave, on the other hand, was impacted by the PyTorch, safe tensors, and restricted on pickling issues. Now, what a lot of people miss is how important and how complex the ML stack is. The model you choose changes the technologies in the stack. So when I'm assessing a system or doing some sort of vulnerability research, I'm always trying to think about what layer of the ML stack I'm dealing with. Uh, so the layers listed are hardware, infrastructure, low level, compiler, high level, framework, model, and knowledge. And I told you about a whole bunch of exploits just now. Of the ones I told you about, the restricted unpickler, ONNX runtime uh, and pickling proof of concepts are the issues that are exposed and impactful at the framework level. Uh, the torch script differential corresponds to the compiler level. And the safe tensors and PyTorch polyglot issues correspond to the infrastructure level. And this is just a starting point. We're going to be seeing exploits up and down the stack that impact ML systems. So if you want to get into attacking ML systems now, this is a solid place to begin. Are you really good at breaking hardware? Go take a look at a TPU. Do you happen to know a lot about distributed system security? Go write some uh, hybrid ML exploits at the infrastructure level. So I made this schema for incubated ML exploits. This is just one piece of a more formal model of exploitation. Um, I'll talk about this just at a very high level to shed some light on the terrain here. So if you want to pull off an incubated ML exploit, you need a write primitive for the weights or the architecture. And the proof of concepts point to some additional capabilities. Um, well, uh, side note, you probably want read primitives as well. Uh, but with the safe tensors parser differential, you saw that access to a metadata could enable both types of backdoors. Um, there's a lot of utility in exploiting model transformations and model differentials. With that, you can construct exploits at different stages of the pipeline with existing procedures. Uh, differentials are also pretty useful for an attacker. They're localized to their stage. And with ONNX, it became kind of obvious that you can maliciously use custom ops in serialization formats, and maybe even in places like compiler dialects. I'll release more details in accompanying materials. But I do want to make some more explicit recs. Oh, apologies for the busy slide here. I think models should be checked for integrity, and their metadata should be well parsed. We want good trust mechanisms, and we want robust validation. We also want to minimize complexity, so we should be avoiding custom operators and separating weights and architecture storage. Um, and I also think we should follow uh, the, be following the recommended practices for file formats more. So you should have versions and checksums and magic signatures. You should enforce your signature at offset zero. And we really need to be investing in robust specifications and tools. So I'm really hoping that we can see more work on hybrid ML exploits and incubated ML exploits. I want to see them addressed by more frameworks and tools. I'd love to see this framework evolved and also be applied to specific ML tools and contexts, as well as more, uh, more bug classes and more model vulnerabilities. I'd also like to see more investigations of exploit persistence, reliability, and defense. Um, I also just think, more generally, there's a lot of interesting work that can be done in ML infrastructure security with differentials and file formats and specifications and even reverse engineering. But before we finish, I want to tell you what helps me identify and make progress on ML security problems. Um, and that's understanding the two root causes. 
First, we're building all of these new systems for ML. New hardware, new programming languages, new compilers, new file formats. There are conferences dedicated just to new and creative ways to design ML infrastructure. Um, and that means these new systems are introducing new attack surfaces. And it's also becoming increasingly clear that the stack and supply chain have not been subject to sufficient review. That's why we're seeing pickles everywhere, right? Second, simply placing an ML model into a program introduces all of these new vulnerabilities that stem from how your model is interacting with different components. Machine learning is not a quick add-on, but something that can fundamentally change the security posture of your system. So I hope you leave this talk knowing that we need to concurrently and holistically think about system security and model security. Uh, I recommend checking out the full audit reports for Safe Tensors and YOLO, as well as the blog posts on Fickling and the File Formats Repository. I'll post more details in accompanying materials. We're hoping to release a paper on this topic as well. Uh, you can find my contact info on my website or send me a message on Twitter. Uh, but thank you all for listening. Um, now I can answer any questions now. Uh, are you aware of any tools that, as a defender, we can use to audit our models periodically, automate the model audit to identify vulnerabilities in it? Uh, so the question, if I understand it correctly, is are there good defense tools for ML security? Uh, so we're uh, hoping to develop Fickling such that it becomes a good detection tool as well. Um, so we, was originally designed for reverse engineering and offense. Um, we, I think it's very useful for incident response folks to uh, be able to look at a pickle file, reverse engineer it, and see if that's potential cause. Um, there's, uh, I'm more of a fan of the secure by default strategy. Uh, so I always tell people, don't use pickle, use safe tensors instead. Um, you should have good trust mechanisms, checksums, things like that. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, a very greenfield area. Uh, so there's a lot of ongoing work in this, and I think we're learning more about it as it goes as it go, uh, as it moves forward. So I'm interested in seeing what comes up. Any other questions? What would be a good way to convince uh, the higher-ups in a company to invest time and money and resources in something like, uh, let's get, like, no more pickle in the code base, let's get rid of pickle. Uh, do you have examples of, uh, I'm thinking of, of, I don't know, like the SolarWinds exploit or LinkedIn got hacked. Like, there's always a, a thing like if we invest in teaching people how to detect phishing attacks of social engineering, that would prevent this. Have any of these machine learning exploits been used in the wild? Could, is there any examples we could point to and say, look, it cost this company $10 million specifically because of Pickle? Or is that something that may be in the future and just not yet because this stuff is so new? So there have been Pickle CVEs. That's uh, a thing I've seen um, with, let's see if I have a slide for it. I don't know of any that can give you a concrete dollar amount, uh, which is uh, difficult. Um, if someone knows, uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, but Sleepy Pickle is, um, there's also a follow-up called Sticky Pickle that does uh, showcase how this can be a surreptitious and dynamic attack. Um, that's one example. I know uh, Wiz has another example of it being used for cross-tenant phones in cloud security. Um, I don't have a slide for that, apologies. But um, there's also a, let me find the slide for it. Sorry, lots of slides here. Uh, that one, I'm just going to point to it. This one is from JFrog and is about how they use Fickling to find real malicious ML models um, on Hugging Face Hub. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, that's as far as I know about it. If anyone has, once again, if anyone has like 
a much uh, so, like so a real Jay dollar Frog and Wiz. Right I'll write those down and look them up later. Okay, thank you. Gotcha. Any more questions? Give it up for Suha. Thank you.